All right, everyone. Welcome to the July HETF webinar. Um, my name is Haley Rivers. I am the Kupu AmeriCorps member for the Hawaii Experimental Tropical Forest this year. And I am the one putting together these webinars for you all. Um, so today we have Liana doing her presentation and I will hand it over to Tabby to do some housekeeping. So thank you all for being here. Oh, Tabby, you're muted. Uh, thank you. I was stuck on mute. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining. I'm Tabby. I'm the resource associate for the Hawaii Experimental Tropical Forest. And I'm really happy you could all join us for our second seminar. A few things before we start. Um, this webinar is being recorded. You can toggle between gallery view and speaker view. Um, once the webinar begins, you'll all be muted. And feel free to put your questions in the chat. They'll be answered at the end of the presentation. And lastly, we'll be sending out a feedback form after the webinar. So we'd appreciate it if you took a few moments to fill that in. Um, and now we'll move right over to Liana. This is Liana McDonald Kainoa. She's the Naku'u Conservation Project Outreach and Education Assistance, Assistant, sorry. And her presentation is titled Biocultural, The Biocultural Approach to Place-Based Conservation at Pulava. It's all yours, Liana. Thank you, Tabby. Um, thank you, and thank Kaylee uh, for hosting the webinar today. Really appreciate the opportunity to present and um, speak more about um, the biocultural approach that the Outreach and Education Program um, with Napu'u Conservation Project um, has been taking. Um, I am going to share my screen. Okay. Oops. Um, so to start off, if you guys want to uh, write in the comment box where you're tuning in from, it's always nice to, to know where our audience is and um, yeah, where, where you're tuning in from. All right. So the presentation that I'm going to be giving today is what Tabby um, introduced, the biocultural approach to place-based conservation at Pu'u Va'ava'a. Um, and Pu'u Va'ava'a is a part of um, Na Pu'u Pu'alu Kini Kini, which is comprised of two Ahu Pu'a'a. We have Pu'u Va'ava'a and Pu'u Wanohulu. It's situated in the north region of Kona, the most northern region, also referred to as Kekaha Vaiole, or the barren land, the land of no streams, no water. Um, and in this picture here, it's a really cool panel. I want to point out on the very left, you can see Kiholo um, and the bay. And then if you go over, you can see Kohala, the hills of Pu'uanahulu, Pu'uva'ava'a in the center, and then Hualalai. Um, so an overview of my presentation throughout the slideshow, I'm going to be um, speaking about biocultural conservation, the importance of it, our outreach and education program, um, some approaches that we've applied, and benefits of integrating this biocultural worldview, um, and some results and feedback, and I'm going to end with what's next and some ideas that I have. So biocultural conservation, um, I have this definition here that I've pulled uh, from the Tropical Botanical, um, the National Tropical Botanical Garden, 
And it says that biocultural conservation is a progressive approach to conservation that recognizes and honors the intrinsic relationships between nature and humanity and builds conservation programs that are founded in cultural values and aligns with community priorities. This human and nature approach leads to more long-term success because it involves the communities connected to the natural resources of concern to support success. Um, so for the sake of this presentation, um, this is the definition that I'll be using when I refer to biocultural conservation. Um, it highlights the progressive approach, which I believe is really progressive, um, and that it really honors the intrinsic relationship and the pulina that we have between nature and humanity. Um, and then the second definition is something that I pulled from the IUCN website um, of culture um, as a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of a society or a social group, and that it encompasses, in addition to art and literature, lifestyles, ways of living together, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. And when we talk about culture, I feel that it really does encompass um, all of those different components. Um, so before we um, move forward, I do want to share an oli um, that was written by Antiku Ule Kiakialani um, for our project and specific to this area of Napu'u. Eyamai na malehinie, kipa mai ai, ke ku kamaha one o hua la la ai, a lai makaya na pu'ua, ke kahava i ole, lua ole ko nanie. Hele o e, hele o i e, e pili me ke aloha e. Um, and so I, I share that because um, I feel like as we're gathering here today, um, I'm not sure how many are on the webinar right now, but we are gathering as a group. Um, and that is something that we would offer um, as if we were together in person um, and offering that to place here at Puawa. Um, and so my, my core message today is that integrating indigenous knowledge and traditional practices into place-based conservation is integral to the health and quality of Hawaii's people and places. Um, and that they're never to be disconnected and that people in place are, are one and the same. All right, so Makavalu um, means eight eyes or um, many perspectives. And I start off with this because I'd like to talk about how shape, um, culture shapes landscape and how humans have been shaping nature and creating landscapes and seascapes for thousands of years. Um, and each culture has influenced and shaped the landscapes to better suit their needs. And these impacts are either intentional or sometimes they're accidental, um, but it is ever evolving and it never stays static. And if we look into our ancient past, Hawaiians relied 100% solely on their environment to provide everything that they needed from food to shelter, medicine, clothing, tools, weapons, implements, adornments, transportation devices, and everything else across the spectrum. Um, so I think that's a great model um, to refer to when we think about natural resource management and sustainability. Um, so for them, it was no question what they needed from their environment and this indigenous culture amassed in-depth knowledge that is worth hundreds and thousands of years of observation, connection, practice, and experience. Uh, and this deep ancestral wisdom was apparent in how they interacted and engaged with nature and their environment. Um, and their perception was everything. Uh, 
Um, so that I see as a foundation um, and something that we have the pri privilege to learn from and to gain a better understanding of how they view the world and how we can implement that into our own worldview um, and create a comprehensive context. Um, and so what does the current landscape say about our culture? And what does the culture say about our landscape? And how is that reciprocal relationship um, engaging with one another? And so the picture I have is on the left is on the pu'u, me on the pu'u. And then the one on the right, you can see it's in the distance. Um, so there's many different ways of looking at one thing. Um, and so la'a loa, um, meaning very sacred, like the beach, like magic sands. Um, and I pose that, and I start with that because it's important that we cultivate a sacred kinship with place. Um, and there are moments in our life that stand out amongst the rest and that differentiate themselves from ordinary mundane moments. And so I want to share a personal story from my own experience um, that demonstrates the mana of Hawaiian culture. And last year I attended the Mary Monarch for the very first time and experiencing it in person was much different than watching it on television. And it's something that I've always wanted to do. So I, I went there with lots of excitement and anticipation. Um, but witnessing it in person and feeling the energy of their presence was awe-inspiring. And the Kane performance in particular was striking to me um, from their words, their movement, and their dance as a group and as a collective. Um, and so that, that feeling that I got, I was very deeply moved in a space that I feel is really tapped into. And it's the kind of moment that gives you the chills. Um, and so I've also experienced that feeling during Oli um, or when large groups of people are singing Mele together. And so I want to paint that, that picture because it, it moves us in such a way that it's capable of stirring up all kinds of things, feelings, emotions, thoughts. Um, and for me, sometimes it, it brings me to tears. Um, so our thoughts and our words and our energy have so much mana behind them. Um, and the message that's conveyed is intangible a lot of the time. Um, so there's something divine about these types of energies that really do transcend time and space and move through physical barriers and enliven and heighten our senses and our consciousness in a whole new way. And that space allows the reawakening of ancestral knowledge and, and mana and this, to me, I consider a spiritual experience. Um, and so I, I hope that you can relate to that story, or I'm sure um, if I feel that way, there's many other people who are also deeply moved by, um, by the Hawaiian culture and experiencing that. So how can we cultivate profound moments that move us internally and transcend place and time? Um, and so with our outreach and education, program, um, we have implemented a protocol um, that we do with every group that, that visits and works with the project, um, and it's our time of Pico. We start off with Ho'o Malie, which is um, a practice that we have uh, borrowed from Ka'u Kulehu, um, and a time of quietness, also a time of Kilo, to really observe your external environment and internal environment and really unites us in what we do because we want to disconnect from everything else and reconnect to place. Um, and that's also a time we share um, Bahipana, we talk about place names, the Mo'okuau Ho of, of this place, um, and we share more information of that nature. And so the Mo'okuau Ho for um, Napu'u is a huala like kapuna hine, hana io o pu'u wa awaa kamakua, o pu'u wa awaa kamakua, hana io o pu'u anahulu, ke keki. 
And so that's one body of knowledge that has been passed down for many, many, many generations. Um, and it means that Hualalai is the grandmother which gave birth to Kuuwa'awa'a, the mother or parent who gave birth to Kuuwa'anuhulu, the keiki. Um, and so that's something that we, we um, take a lot of pride in sharing because these stories um, and this Ike was shared with us. Um, and when we cultivate and nurture that sacred, sacred relationship to place with cultural practices such as Oli and Mele or, or Hula, um, we, we merge with the place um, on a deeper level and um, really having reverence for nature is foundational to creating a good relationship and it supports the quality of our interactions um, with the environment and how we engage with it. Um, and one last thing I wanna share um, here is that I once heard um, a few years ago, I forget where, um, that nature is an infinite relationship. Um, so you can ignore it for days, weeks, or even years, but it will always be there when you return. It may be in a different condition, but nevertheless there. Um, it's not like having a friend or a boyfriend that you have and then goes away. It's always there. Um, and so I think that's, that's really profound and always good to keep in mind. So Kiina um, and our relationship to place um, is so intrinsic um, and everything is interconnected. And so I feel that since I have been working with Napu'u Conservation Project, it's really inspired me uh, to dive deeper into Hawaiian culture. Um, which has really expanded my learning and my consciousness in so many ways. Um, and learning about it, your worldview does shift and change. And you see things, begin to see things differently. Um, and so that relationship is, is really important. Um, the relationship um, that Native Hawaiians had in the past um, were so strongly tied um, to nature and in this place in particular um, it was important to the ali'i um, and many kanaka they would gather feathers um, from many of the forest birds um, in the upland Moka forest and they would utilize the native plants such as the one on the right, which is Papala Kipel. And it has this sticky adhesive um, seed pod. And they would catch the birds, pluck a feather from under its wing and, and release it. And so you can imagine the abundance of native forest birds that existed at that time, because one of um, these cloaks that you see there, the Ahaula, required thousands upon thousands of feathers. And you know those feathers are really, really tiny. Um, and also to make the mahi ole or the helmets and then the kahili staff. Um, and then on the left is um, the kuila. And kuila was also very important um, to the ali'i as well as the nakoa or the warriors. And they used the kuila to um, craft weapons and other sorts of implements. Um, and then of course, La'au Lapa'au was also really important as well as cordage and everything else. Um, and so their relationship with these plants were, um, they relied on them. It's a little different for us today um, since we have the convenience of going to the store and we have many more options to choose from. Um, and then just moving more into contemporary times. Um, of course, there was the ranching area, era um, that lasted over a hundred years that really also shaped the landscape and um, also um, changed the land use dramatically. And this picture here is my great, great grandpa on the left up here at Pu'uwa'awa'a. Um, so we created an interpretive trail at the um, at Ho'aina, which is one of our main restoration sites. And we have 22 signs. 
put up that talk about place, geology, mo'olelo, and the majority of the signs are about the native plants, um, many of which are endangered, and it highlights their cultural uses um, and also whether they're used medicinally. So that's been really important because anyone that's visiting that area can walk this trail and learn more about those plants and why they were so important. Um, and a lot of times we don't see these plants uh, in our everyday lives, so they really are unique and, and rare. Um, so where else are you supposed to learn about them? Okay, so na kilo aina, um, i ola oi, i ola mako ne. Once we become extremely observant of place, you, we gain a more in-depth understanding of our environment, of nature, what it's there for, what we're there for in our role, um, and again, that pilina that we have. And so you really need to spend time in an area to, to know it really well. Um, and then when you have that close, intimate connection, it, it has extreme benefits, and you're only, it's only more likely that you will take care of that place. Um, and then, of course, iola oi, iola makone. Um, when you thrive, we thrive. That's um, the thinking behind that. And, and we share that with people on every plant that goes in the ground. We love to give it that aloha. Um, and that when you live, we live, and that we're dependent on one another, whether we like that or not. Um, so, again, this slide is. Um, just highlighting the na kilo aina and working with groups and really um, focusing on things like phenology of the different plants and animals at Puwawa um, and observing what things are seeding, what's bud budding or flowering, what are the birds doing, what type of birds do we see, where are these birds, what time of day, everything um, from all that there is, the clouds, the temperature, the weather, um, and so a lot of times we do go up to the top of the Pu'u where there's a really um, amazing view and you can see 360 all around you and we really um, take time to kilo up there and find that that's definitely a special elevated place um, and it's really quiet. So it, it kind of um, brings you into silence which is nice because then you are really uh, aware of what else is going on. And Malama Aina, um, so being when we have that, that sacred kinship that we cultivate, um, we build that relationship and we observe and we become Ma'a to that place, we become the stewards of that land. And I think it happens without knowing. It's one of those things where we visit or um, maybe you've spent a lot of time there when you're younger, your grandparents are from there, whatever it is. Um, it happens. It just draws you to it. Um, and so with that, we do end up carrying a sense of kuleana and a responsibility. Um, and the more we, we put in, I truly believe the more you get out of the experience. And it is reciprocal, um, like everything else. And so we here at um, the project are definitely, I know I'm really thankful and grateful um, that we have cultural practitioners um, to, to turn to who have, um, who are lineal descendants and who have ohana that have been living on these lands for many, 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 many generations. Um, and there's so much to learn from them. And then there's just a plethora of ike. Um, and so when we approach that, that um, sense of stewardship from the biocultural worldview um, and sense of being, we are not only helping to perpetuate an indigenous culture, but we're also building our own definition of what it looks like to be a modern steward. Um, so we usually, um, 
pre-COVID uh, would have two monthly volunteer days and we'd have our community work day and then we'd have La Ohana day which is more geared toward um, keiki and families and so pictured here is was Layla's last Ohana day so we had a really good turnout um, and it's it's just always amazing to work with great people and um, also have the opportunity to create a space where um, parents can bring their children um, outdoors and in an area to, to learn more about these plants and to play and to, to plant a tree and just to be there and to be present. Um, so during our volunteer days, um, most times we would have a potluck and <laughs> we definitely have always looked forward to the potlucks. You never know um, what's going to be there. And the type of cuisine that we've had has just been all over the place and it's just been great and delicious. I was a vegetarian before these potlucks. Um, and it's really nice to have local meat and just everything. And, and that's one of our favorite times of just like sitting down, really connecting um, with each other, talking story, getting to know one each other, getting to know one another, and really building um, that community. And also um, the middle picture is, um, is our group oops, doing hay. And hay is a um, like a visual representation with string that goes along with um, an oli or a mele or a mo'olelo and that um, tells the story through through images and an actual physical um, representation. Um, so that's one thing that we like to share. Um, sometimes it's hula, sometimes it's an oli. Um, and as much as possible, incorporating the language and talking about it. And um, even if it's just an olelo no eao or something small, it's still contributing um, and passing on information. So aloha aina, um, and socially and ecologically oriented, um, and here I want to touch on the, the comprehensive approach of biocultural conservation. I feel that it's very in, inclusive um, of the community, of the culture, of people's strengths and skills, um, and what each individual has to bring to the table, um, which is important. Everyone has something to offer. Um, and this collaborative approach really does, um, it's rooted in, in values and it has a vision. And when people work together, um, it's clear that, that a lot can, can be done. Um, so some of the partnerships um, we have are with, the PCB SFA project or the Pu'uwa'awa'a Community Based Subsistence Forest Area. And if you saw Becca's presentation last month, she talked a little bit more about this. Um, and it's a community based partnership um, along with Akaka Foundation for Tropical Forest, which is a nonprofit, and then as well as the, the agencies in the state, um, DOFA and Federal Side Forest Service. Um, and it's committed to, this project is committed to um, restoring an 84 acre unit on the Ku'u, which is pictured there. Um, and that fence was recently finished um, with the help of Ku'u, um, who helped to uh, fence a portion of it a couple summers ago. Um, I was able to help out with that project too. It was really cool learning how to fence um, with the National Park Service. And yeah, um, it's, uh, it's fairly new and it's really unique 
in that it's um, a community-based forest managed area. Um, and so this process um, is really complex. And so I think that it really does take everyone, the community, um, we have multi-generational community members um, on the project. And then, like I said, the nonprofit and the agency side, and it's, um, you know, everyone working together um, and participating. Um, and I think this is a great example of integrating multiple knowledge um, systems. Um, and then the HETF side of things. Um, so the HETF education permit has allowed um, many, many groups, educational groups, to stay here at Puawa overnight at one of the state facilities um, for free um, in exchange that they support the management plan and um, majority of our planting I would say are, are, are done with through volunteer work and so this is huge because it, it gives the, the group a chance to really have a more in-depth experience they get to stay overnight they perhaps have their own programs but they make time to give back and um, go on a whole cut year do a service learning project with us, um, which either consists of out planting, seed collecting, weed control, um, maybe trail building, cleaning, um, just kind of whatever is needed. And so that has been huge. And I know the community also appreciates the opportunity to stay up here. Um, and then recently HWMO, um, and as well as now Pu'u Conservation Project has been working with Wanahulu community um, and their Firewise Committee um, that was recently formed to protect our communities and um, their neighborhood, their homes over there, as well as the forest. Um, so that's also, I feel like, another progressive approach to um, natural resource management and the community um, really um, participating and helping with these, um, some of these issues and how to mitigate them. Um, and then of course, KUPU and the CLDP program in HYCC, also another huge support. Um, I started off as a, as a KUPU CLDP here um, for two terms. And so I'm really grateful for that opportunity and connecting me with KUPU Va'a Va'a. Um, and then we also have um, the Dryland Forest Hui, um, which is, I think there's six different organizations um, that are a part of that. And every month we go to a different site and we really um, just help each other out on those days. We have a, a large group of conservation professionals and we just get like a ton done um, and accomplished. And it's always nice to see other people um, that are working in, in the field as well. And um, so all of this being said, touching back on culture again and substance, I feel like culture is the, the mud and the glue um, that not only holds, but unites us with nature, that unites humanity with nature. And that cultural substance is what really provides a deeper context for much to learn from. It gives meaning to something that may otherwise be considered ordinary. It has the power to transform an ordinary, ordinary moment to an extraordinary moment. Um, and it's very crucial to maintain these practices and protocols and traditions, um, which places a lot of importance on having an educational framework and that education creates a pathway for biocultural learning. Um, and the intention behind one of our biggest outreach events, uh, the Biocultural Blitz, um, which is a partnership with the HETF, Forest Service, Kupu, um, and DOFA. And um, we've been able to host three PCBs so far at Puawa. Um, and there are 254 grade students from West Hawaii that attend and have the opportunity to learn more about environmental science, 
and biocultural resource management um, in eight different subject areas. And um, this event is definitely, I mean, it's only possible because there's so many people that are contributing to this effort. Um, we have 16 different stations at this event, so that's almost 16 different organizations um, that volunteer their time um, to educate Homana and to do activities, hands on activities with them. Um, and unfortunately, um, this year we did have to cancel um, the fourth annual biocultural blitz due to COVID and the pandemic. Um, but moving forward, I think it's a great opportunity to look at um, providing this type of education um, to an online platform. And um, I'm not sure what next year looks like, but I'm sure that like everyone else um, has had to do, um, we just have to get used to using um, the internet and the World Wide Web as a, as a major platform for sharing. Um, and so we also partner with um, programs like Teaching Change, Iniporonoka um, Aina, Future Foresters from Waikolo Dry Forest Initiative, and um, Kamehameha School Scholars. And those programs um, definitely have a more um, in-depth experience um, with their groups. Um, some of them are overnight, and we do get to take them on guided nature tours, um, teach them more about the native plants, we get to ID native plants, um, as well as a bunch of other activities where they collect data on ohia trees, um, we might do some bird watching and identify native or introduced birds. Um, so it really ranges um, activity-wise. Um, but being that they're here in place, um, I think place speaks for itself. And so um, as long as they're inquiring and we're helping them to investigate more, um, I think that's a really meaningful experience for them, especially at, at that age um, as students. Um, and then just sharing things like mo'olalo, um, hula, like kumoku hali'i, different oli that are also place um, specific hay um, during more kilo and things of that nature. Um, these are some pictures from teaching change and um, doing a, a hike up to the pu'u, walking through the forested section, looking at insects and bugs and um, just as learning as much as we can. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And I think the bottom right picture um, is Blair teaching them more about climate change. Um, and that one picture on the bottom, it's hard to see, but there's a tiny, tiny little snail. And um, we had no idea what it was, but we found out that it's a native snail. Not exactly sure what the name of it is, um, but that's really cool. And we really would have never known it existed or was there unless someone was observing and looking super carefully and looking closely at these plants. Um, so another um, thing that I've, I've had to learn and also share is mo'olelo. There's a specific mo'olelo um, of this place of how um, Pu'uwa'awa and Pu'uwanuhulu receive its name. Um, and if you haven't heard that mo'olelo before, I'd be happy to share it with you at another time. Um, but it, it speaks of Wa'a Wa'a, who's an ali'i and his chiefess, Anahulu, um, who was a seer priestess and a descendant of the Maka'ula um, lineage. So she was a descendant of Kahunas and she had special abilities. So it's really interesting um, to, to hear these stories and how they, they made it over here to Kona from Puna with their daughters. And their daughters are Naiho Omalu and Puako. And so those are places that, that we know. Um, and you would never know the context behind it unless you heard the mo'olelo. Um, so again, people in place are just never 
um, separated, they're just still connected and place names are especially um, important to know the, the Kauna or the deeper meaning behind, behind the place. We'll just wait for the slideshow to load. Um, I think I might be having some connectivity issues. Uh, one minute. Okay, so I'm not sure if um, the slideshow is going to load. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. Okay. Okay, maybe it's just that one slide. I'm going to go ahead and skip it. Um, yeah, that last slide was um, Throwback Thursday. And so I wanted to mention that because that kind of goes along with Mo'olelo and um, Ka'au, or, or story. And um, we, I started the Throwback Thursday like maybe a couple of months ago um, as a way to reflect on the time that we've spent here at, at Pu'uva'ava'a um in hopes that people would share their their memories or a story of a time of them volunteering with us hiking here anything and um i was really surprised at the response um the response has been really positive and a lot of the stories um go back into the 70s and you know or the 80s just um earlier in time and so um from that, that's kind of a lot has grown from it as far as um, what I've learned, what um, what I'm continuing to learn, and a lot of people have been sharing photos um, and books and documents and newspaper clippings and all kinds of things um, that I'm working on archiving and, and documenting. Um, and I've been able to conduct two interviews um, with um, Sally Rice and, and Dr. Billy Bergen, um, who are very familiar with this place, um, as well as the, the ranching in Paniolo era. And um, yeah, I, it's, it's just amazing um, what, what, I, what, <laughs> what one idea can turn into. Um, now I'm like being given pictures and stuff and I, I had no intention of it, but it's, it's really, it's just taking life of its, of it, of its own. Um, that's all I'll say about it, but it's been a really um, great experience learning more about this place. Um, and so Kona um, means the, the hidden meaning or the deeper meaning of something and with everything that I've shared, um, it really has uh, helped me create a sense of purpose in the work that I do here um, as a steward, as an educator, um, and as a, a person that, that works and lives and plays in this, in this space. Um, and so I think all of these practices can be adopted into your everyday life and before you know it, it just becomes intertwined um, 
And for me, like when I first started, even though I lived here my whole life, um, I'm Hawaiian, you know, I, I, I learned uh, only and all that kind of stuff in school. Um, there's such a, a long period of time where that wasn't a part of my everyday life um, that when I began um, practicing it, that Hawaiian culture here with this project, it was somewhat uncomfortable and unfamiliar, not unfamiliar, but we're not comfortable doing something until we practice doing it. And so like the thought of sharing an oli or a mele in front of people was frightening to me. I'm like, you know, I don't have any formal practice. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to sound good or sound right. Um, and I feel like that's something that I've heard from other people as well. And I think it's a, a common theme, and I'm sure that's um, similar in a lot of other situations um, with other cultures. But just taking it little by little is really um, helpful, and like not being afraid to make mistakes, I think, is an, it's really helpful. Um, and it's just so gratifying um, once once you do it. And so um, I hope that all is coming together. Aohe hana nui ike alu ia, which means no task is too big um, when done together by all. And this picture is showing um, Waikia High School. And we created a hali hali line that day and built um, a rock wall. Um, to border the trail and it was just such a fun day and I think that that simple concept of hali hali creating a line passing rocks down and just that simple act is really powerful and everyone is cooperating and working together and you don't have to work as hard um, so I truly believe um, that the thoughts behind many hands make for light work or like this olalo no eao that no no task is too big when done by all is that we really have to um work together and it does take a lot of people to accomplish um to accomplish things especially i think in the field of conservation um and natural resource management um so lokahi just that unity that harmony of everyone um uniting together as a group um, and culture and having positive, meaningful experience, um, experiences in space, um, bring people back and build relationships with place and community and um, create stewards, it fosters um, stewardship on many levels. And 99%, um, 99.9% .9 of the feedback um, I've ever received here um, from groups and from people that we've worked with have been positive. And um, it's been really meaningful to do this work and to meet so many um, people from our islands and also from um, the mainland or internationally, wherever they're from, um, and just seeing how much they appreciate the culture or something like Oli. Um, and I think that that feedback is really important um, to know. It's, it's it's a it's a confirmation, um, and so I just want to share some photos um, that I have from volunteer days and Ohana days or service learning projects. Um, there have been a lot of people who have volunteered with us, and we appreciate every single person so much. Um, and then these are just some numbers not just some numbers, but they're numbers um, of the last three years. Um, we've had 211 groups um, that have worked with us and we have 1,666 adults, 1,062 keiki um, for a total of 2,728 volunteers. Um, service time, we've put in 1,000 um, 19, 1,019.25 hours, um, but all together, um, the total volunteer time has been um, over 10,000 hours. 
um, which is a lot. That's um, 453 days worth of time. Um, so it is nice to um, quantify it and to see the numbers there um, and to review it at the end of the year and to really um, see like, wow, this is how many people we've reached out to. Um, this is how many people have been connecting to this place, who have had access to these restoration sites, who have been learning more about these plants and our project and the efforts that are going on here. Um, and so what's next? Um, just one idea that I, I had um, going off of biocultural approaches and how to um, bring that more to the community. I thought maybe um, if it was possible, creating an online platform would be really awesome um, to allow the community to actively participate with Nakilo Aina um, and allowing them to upload observational data onto this website, which maybe they can also include a photo along with details or a description, a short narrative to go along with their entry. Um, and of course, we can launch some sort of campaign online on social media to raise awareness about that and also post signs at the hiker check-in station to inform hikers that they can participate. And um, this promotes a lot of community-based um, participation and, and we can see um, we can mock a value from many different eyes. And I'd like to say mahalo piha. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you for being here. This picture is of um, my auntie Annette, who's one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. And she planted this um, um, ma'ohauhele in honor of her grandson and named it Carter. Um, and this was about two years ago. So Carter has grown um, and mahalo nui. And I would also like to say that there's a lot, a lot of people to Mahalo um, who have shared their, their knowledge and their time and all of the different partners and agencies and the ones that I also didn't mention. There's, there are a lot. So um, thank you for letting me share today. All right. So thank you so much, Liana, for sharing your presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, you should be able to unmute yourself now if you would like to ask a question with your voice or your camera, but you are also welcome to put any questions you have into the group chat. So yeah, thank you so much, Liana. That was so cool. Great, thank you so much, Haley. Thank you, good presentation. Thank you, Mom, I appreciate it. Thanks for staying till the end. Yeah, we had a pretty good turnout. I'm very excited about it. Oh, um, also, uh, we will be sending out a feedback form, so please fill that out if you have any thoughts about how the presentation was so that we can improve for the future or know what you guys really liked about it. Uh, oh, we have a question. Uh, Phil Hester asks, any plans to do more plantings? Um, so at the moment, um, no, we're not with any volunteer groups. We're not allowed to um, host any volunteers, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, I think the Aina misses everyone. Um, and it's really unknown when we'll be able to, to do that again. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for joining.
All right. So I guess if there are no more questions, it's just um, thank you so much, Liana, for presenting for us and telling us about Absolutely. all these amazing things that are going on at Puva Um Thanks, Liana. It was really thank great. You, thank you all so much for tuning in from all over the big island and from places like, um, didn't we had somebody from West Africa, didn't we? Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Liberia, West Africa. And we had, um, I, my parents joined from Massachusetts. So your presentation reached some fun corners of the world. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it requires everybody to make an event like this possible. So thank you all so much. Mahalo, Nui. Thank you.